We're so appreciative of each of our panelists for joining us and creating this opportunity for community. Before we leap into our plan for this evening, for those of, uh, for those of you who don't know us, we want to briefly introduce ourselves. My name is Ty Katzenstein and I'm a clinical psychologist. I have a small private practice in Newton and I'm so fortunate to be able to co-direct the Resilience Project Parents Program at Newton Wellesley with Juliana. Just to give you a little context, the Resilience Project is a philanthropically funded program of the hospital's Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, which supports our community work with schools and families. Our focus as co-directors of the Resilience Project's Parents and Caregivers Program is to support parents in our community and to help parents support the emotional wellness of kids and teens. And hi everyone, my name is Juliana Chen. I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And of course I work alongside Ty at Newton Wellesley Hospital. I also work at Mass General Hospital and have a small private practice in Cambridge. And as Ty just mentioned, she and I have the wonderful honor of co-directing our programs, Parents and Caregivers Program. So um, to reiterate, Ty and I really cannot express enough how much we enjoy our work with parents and schools and the larger community through parent workshops and events like this. It is truly one of our most favorite things to do professionally. So thank you all for joining us. We are thrilled to have the most incredible group of individuals with us tonight, both from the film Sisters on Track and our local community. And so we'll transition now to the first panel. We have two panels. We are so incredibly lucky to be able to speak with the director of this incredible film, Corinne, and two of the Shepherd Sisters. Oh, I think one or two of the Shepherd Sisters. We'll see who shows up. And Coach Jean, and if you could turn your cameras on to join us. And Ty, we can do some brief introductions. Yeah, I'm going to briefly introduce everybody. Corinne Vanderborsch is a Dutch artist and award-winning documentary filmmaker based in Brooklyn. Um, where she graduated with an MFA from the School of Visual Arts. Her work is screened in Edinburgh, London, Amsterdam, New York, and Los Angeles. When her latest documentary, Sisters on Tra Track, launched on Netflix, she initiated a grassroots impact campaign with the hope that the film will give people a greater understanding of the value of mentorship and coaching through sports. Coach Jean Bell was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, where she attended Erasmus Hall High School and later City College of New York in Harlem. She began running track in junior high school and was a competitive runner in high school and college. Jean graduated from Brooklyn Law School and in 1985, she founded Jeunesse Track Club, using her own funds to start and fully support the team. After working as a practice attorney, she became an administrative law judge with the New York State Department of Labor. She does this while continuing to serve as the head coach of the Jeunesse Track Club. So Corinne and Coach Jean, we are absolutely thrilled to have you here with us. Thank you. And we are so thrilled to have Rain Shepherd here. And for those of you who've seen the film, you all know who she is. But Rain, you correct me if I'm wrong. Are you 16 now? which is so hard to believe because you've grown up so much since the film, right? She's 16 and I think still running and in high school um, at Bishop Laughlin High School in Brooklyn, New York. And so thank you so much, all of you for joining us. We are so thrilled and appreciate you coming to talk with us today. Um, Corinne, we thought we could start with you a little bit. We are so interested to hear about the making of Sisters on Track and how you even came to find the Shepherd Sisters and Coach Jean. And Darby, grade six, um, who's a sole train runner and a local student in Boston, wanted to know what inspired you to make Sisters on Track and um, who, who you were hoping to inspire by making this film. Hi, Juliana. Thank you for having, having all of us. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here and to talk to everyone. Um, and yeah, where should I start? I guess where it all began in Brooklyn. Uh, where I live with my, uh, with my, with my children and my husband. Um, they go to a local public school here. Uh, and um, one of my friends actually met um, uh, the, the sisters, Ty, Rain and Brooke and their mom, Tonya at a fundraiser. Um, and shortly after she introduced me to the family and said that perhaps it might be um, an interesting film for me to, to you know, to, to at least talk talk to the girls, talk to, to Tonya. So um, I, I spoke 
Sonia and uh, the girls had just come back from uh, winning gold medals at the Junior Olympics that summer um, and were, were evicted. Uh, so it was a, there, was a, there was a lot going on in their life at that moment. Uh, and Tonya said, well, I think if, if, you're really, if you really want to make a film, I think the one person you have to speak to is uh, Coach Jean. <laughs> she, she will be the one to give her blessing or she will say, no, it's a bad idea. So, so I, I jumped on my bike and went to the track where, where Juness uh, practices and, and sat on the bleachers and, and spoke with Jean for a while and introduced myself and she gave me a, a good long look <laughs> and, um, and decided I should come back. Uh, I told her I would come back, not months, but probably years, that it would be a, a, long, a long project uh, that she should be ready for. And I don't think she believed me, <laughs> um, but that's how it all came about. So uh, it started off at a school and yeah. Amazing. I can understand why you were intrigued to tell this story, especially this dichotomy of the medals and and also them being in a shelter. Um, Jean, why did you give the bless your blessing? Well, I didn't know that it would become such a big project, but you know, I'm always willing to help out uh, female entrepreneurs and artists, and and it seemed like something she really wanted to do, and uh, I thought it would be great for her to uh, get the girls on film. <laughs> that's really lovely um I'm just curious sir, what was it actually be I mean you were sort of speaking to that it was a project what was it like to actually be in the film and then to have it see it come out on Netflix and Raina also interested in your experience of that well um <laughs> I never I never imagined that it would be on Netflix I was shocked um <laughs> I, I, she followed us around for years, everywhere we went to <laughs> practice, to meets, out of state, in state, uh, you know, it, it got so that we didn't really notice her anymore. Mm -hmm. It was a normal thing um, for us, for other teams and coaches, it was extraordinary. But um, <laughs> so when I heard that it was coming out on Netflix, it was just really wild and to see yourself I mean, I'm just an ordinary person <laughs> to see yourself on TV or when I when I upload Netflix to look at anything, I, I see myself and even my son, you know, is excited every time they see it. So it's pretty <laughs> It's hilarious. What about for you, Rain? Was that was that strange kind of being in a film and then having it on Netflix? What's that been like? Um, it was it was only really strange in the beginning. Well, in the beginning of the recording, it was a bit weird because no one's ever followed me around with the camera before. But um, as I got older, because it was, in fact, years. So as I got older, <laughs> um, it was just normal, like Coach Jean said. And then when I finally, like, it, it became really normal. And then I was like, at, to the point where I was like, is this movie ever going to come out? And <laughs> then it came out and it got like, <laughs> like on Netflix. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's me there. So that's how, then, then it became weird. So mm -hmm. it just recently started coming. And do people recognize you guys sometimes? Like when you're out in public yeah. or out on the street? Yeah. Mostly Coach Jean, though. Mostly Coach Jean. Because of Coach Jean? Yeah. Well, well I mean, the girls have changed so much since the film started. So I basically look the same. <laughs> well, Jean, Coach Jean, Judge Jean. <laughs> Right, we understand that you're an attorney, a judge. You also you've coached Rain and her sisters and so many other young women. Um, and I guess the coaching, I don't know which you consider, like which you do on the side. <laughs> um, but I think everything. I don't know when you sleep, but could you tell us just a little bit about what got you started in coaching and, you know, kind of what inspired you to to found your track club and why why you devote so much of your time and energy and heart to coaching young girls. Well, I, I ran when I was young and my sister and I, we loved to run when we were just kids. We ran everywhere. And my brother started a track team at the Catholic school where we went and we ran. And then we ran through high school. And um, actually before I even 
graduated from high school, I took over that Catholic school team and coached it for 10 years. And I had such good uh, talent. I really wanted to take the girls farther. So I started Jeunesse Track Club, obviously, before I was married and had children and had other things to do. So uh, (laughs) I started Jeunesse and, you know, it was just a hobby for me. And I devote as much time to it as I did to my own training, going to practice, going to meets. And if you want to do well, you have to put in the time and the effort. And if, if I wanted my team to do well, I had to put in the time and effort with that also. You know, there's a um, quote in the trailer, um, this is, I guess, for Coach Jean and Corinne, um, that says, everyone needs a goal, and it really stood out to me. Can you say a little bit more about this? Why are goals, or in what way are goals so important, you know, especially for kids? I know we talk about that often as adults, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about sort of how you see that, why is that important for kids? Well, kids, all kids, not just girls, girls and boys, they need structure. They need something to look forward to and to work towards. And it doesn't have to be an athletic goal. It can be any goal. Like I say, everyone needs a goal (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. because everyone does. I mean, even adults need a goal. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you give kids a goal, then they'll stay on the straight and narrow for the most part. But if they're just out there floundering around, you then you're going to lose them, especially in Brooklyn, New York, you'll lose them to the streets. Mm-hmm. There's a question in the that someone just put in the chat box for you, Coach Jean, on this idea of goals and inspirations. Is there someone that you consider your biggest inspiration? And this person says, I was so inspired by your wonderful balance of unconditional love and quote unquote, tough love to bring the best out of your girls. Do you have a big inspiration? I mean, I was inspired by female mentors in my family. My my grandmother fostered uh, so many children during the time I was growing up. And we always looked at that in a special way because children were treasured and, and held in high esteem. So even though she had eight children of her own, she fostered over 30 children during her lifetime. And those children were treated just like family. They became part of our family. And then my mother, who gave me the name Juness, which means young ladies, for the track club, she had five children of her own, but she always gave us individual attention, and, and love and caring. And she was just a great person. I love that so much. I don't know, Corinne, if you have someone that inspired you, if there was something about the Shepherd Sisters and Coach Jean that you found so inspiring that you decided I wanna make this film or tell this story. For me, the, the inspiration to tell this story um, came, I think the moment I walked onto the track and met Jean and, and took uh, took you know and took in what what was going on um because the girls they range from five the youngest are five and the oldest are you know 17 18 and to see um just to see the 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 level of responsibility that they were given and how they how they were treated and and how the groundedness i think that i was noticing with in this certain group of girls really um I, I mean, it was beyond intriguing. I was just completely drawn into it, and I wanted to. I wanted to understand how that came about. Um, um, and it was around the corner from where I live, so 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 I knew I could come back. It was something that I could <laughs> actually, you know. That's so. That's always the problem when you make films that you have to say, "I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back." Um, you know, the fact that it's generations of women um, uplifting other women and girls and women uh, helping out one another um, to me is is always a, a story that I'm interested in to, to, to tell the story of strong women and um, I, the coaches that are on, on Juness they ran most of them all ran for Jean uh, and for Carol 
so they had children of their own who are now girls running for Juness. So, so it's a very much of a, um, a, 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 a continuum um, of, of grit and love, tough love. And um, it was very inspirational from the, from the get-go for me. Great. Hey, Rain, I'm wondering, we have a question from a local fifth grader who um, would love to get your thoughts and your perspective on this question. Um, this fifth grader is asking, what's the best and what's the hardest part about being on a track team? And how do you support um, each other while you're running as individuals on a team? Well, and as you think about that, Rain, for one second, I have to say that there was a quote in the movie that I don't even know if you remember that you said it, but I'm pretty sure you said it that you said my track family is an actual family, which I really, really love so much. And um, just as Ty, you were asking her this question, I, I couldn't help but think of that quote. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I love that question. What's the best part about being a track team and why is it like a family? And maybe what are the hard parts? The best part about being on a track team is that it's a team so everyone helps each other even though track is an individual sport but as a team we all like encourage each other to do our best even if we're each other's opponents at certain times we all push each other to be better than especially in our sport but also outside our sport because we're family so we worry about other things besides that like school you know make sure everyone is um, feeling welcome on the team. Mm -hmm. But the hard part about being, there's nothing really hard about being on this. Oh, well, <laughs> competitive, being competitive with your friends, mm -hmm. it's, it can be hard sometimes, but not, not too hard. There's really nothing bad about being on a team. It's really cool. And about the family, yeah, I think our team, I think all teams are like families, but because I've only experienced my team. I think our team is the best family. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Rain, but maybe, maybe in a way you already answered it. But I, as I watched the film, I was wondering about what kept you and your sisters going and what kind of helped you guys to have hope during harder times in your life, either maybe harder times while you were practicing or harder times like when you guys were living in the homeless shelter. Um, what, what kept you and your sisters running and what kept you to be hopeful? What kept us hopeful was definitely Coach Jean and our mom. But what kept us running was definitely Coach Jean and Coach <laughs> it Definitely, because we were just we were just running. We, we didn't even know how, where it could take us, what we were doing even. We were just, just doing what we were told. And even if we didn't want to do it, Coach Jean would be like, do it. Or Coach Carol would be like, do it or else. So we just did it. And <laughs> it, it, it clearly helped us a lot. <laughs> and yeah, if it weren't, weren't for them, we wouldn't be on a team or here. So yeah. like that. So people can just say, just do it. But I don't think anyone yeah. could say it. I think there was maybe something special <laughs> about when Coach Jean says it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> listen if it wasn't Coach Jean <laughs> or my mom, but you know. Get maybe by the maybe by the end of this webinar, we'll figure out what the magic is because Coach Jean, there are a lot of parents and educators watching. So if we can just figure out what the magic is when you say just do it <laughs> to get the kids to do it, I think a lot of parents and educators and coaches would be so excited to know. So you think about that magic formula and you let us know by the end of the webinar, okay? <laughs> um, hi, I'm mindful of time. Yeah, I know. Can we I, do some of our last ones? I well, think before. so. Mm -hmm. I think that makes the most sense. Um, so this is sort of, you know, I guess to all of you as sort of a close up um, for this for this part for of the this panel. section yeah. of the panel. Yeah, um, I guess for Corinne and Coach Jean, what are you hoping that viewers take away from this film? And Terrain, um, what would you say to students who watch the film who are with us today, to kids who maybe want to try something new that they've never tried before, um, or who, who are thinking in their minds about pursuing some kind of dream? Those are sort of our wrap up questions and we can start in whatever order makes sense. Um, like for, 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 for me, I think it, 
as a as a filmmaker as a storyteller i hope everyone will be inspired um, to look around and see their own community um, and 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 be and be someone for someone um, i think that's the one uh, big inspiration that that i hope people will take away from it and of course, you know, if kids want to start running, great. But but that as a core, that you can always be there for someone else, I think is um, is is something great. I love that message that you can always be there for someone else. How about you, Jean? Is there a takeaway or something that you hope people can walk away from after watching the film? Well, I mean, I hope that people see that sports, especially, can help kids grow not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, and it makes you strong, it makes you tough. And people are always asking me, what do you look for in athletes and new athletes? And I say a girl with grit, mm -hmm. a girl who is strong physically and mentally because it helps you to, uh, to grow and to be a better athlete and to be a better person. Um, and it helps you throughout your life. Once you get into that mindset that you say, I won't let this beat me, or I won't let this get me down, then that helps you in all facets of your life. I love that. <laughs> and Rain, for all the people who are watching, and there are people who are also going to be watching this as a recording later, and there's also lots of students who are going to be watching, is there anything that you'd want to say to them? especially if they're new to running or maybe they're trying some other dream or goal for the first time, what would you say to them? I think I would say that if you really like what you do, then it's gonna be hard. So just keep trying, even if it's hard, especially if it's hard. Hmm. Cause I mean, it wouldn't be fun if it wasn't hard or it wouldn't like do anything for you or help you if it was just easy or you, if you took the easy hmm. road. So take the harder road is what I would say. <laughs> we have a future coach, Jean, in the works. I have a feeling. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be a coach in the future. And thank you so much, Corinne and Rain, for joining us. And you can join us still in the background. But thank you so much for joining for this first part of the discussion. And we'd love to invite our other amazing panelists to join. JJ and Yvelle and Jess. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank Hi. You. Hi, you guys. Can I come and do some brief introductions and we can continue this discussion? Sure. sure. So Jess Leffler, I'm so happy to have you here, Jess, is director and founder of Soul Train, which is here in Boston. Jess founded Soul Train inspired by her deep belief that in training for long distance and often seemingly impossible races, kids with the support of strong, joyful community can experience greatness and realize what they are capable of. Jess received a BA from Vanderbilt University and an MA in mental health counseling and art therapy specialization from Lesley University. We're so happy also to welcome Eval Joseph, who's a professional coach and co-principal owner at Performance Fitness and Training, LLC. He focuses on fitness, athletic performance training, speed to marathon endurance training, and developing a healthy lifestyle. Evel is an old soul at Soul Train. He provides youth mentorship via sports and fitness coaching, and he brings a mindfulness perspective to health and wellness to all the kids he works with. And last but definitely not least, Dr. Jonathan Jenkins, SID, CMPC. JJ is a clinical psychologist and certified mental um, performance consultant who works in MGH Child Adolescent Psychiatry Department and MGH's Sports Psychology Department. As a performance psychologist, JJ has experience working with various athletes, including youth, collegiate, amateur, professional, and Olympic athletes. We're so honored to have all of them here with us, right, Ty? Yes. Um, there's so much I think we want to talk about with them. Maybe we could start very briefly since everyone knows about the Jeunesse Track Club now after watching the film. Just for those of us in our audience who aren't famil familiar with Soul Train, could you maybe very briefly let our audience know um, about the program and what inspired you to start it? Sure, thank you. Um, and just I want to say again, Coach Jean and Rain, uh, you just hats off to you guys. I, you're just so inspiring, everything that you've done. Um, so my story is I grew up um, hating running. I love sports, basketball and soccer and all sports, but I hated running. I thought it was boring and hard and not fun. 
And in 2007, as a bucket list thing, I decided that I would train for and run the Chicago Marathon. Um, and the process of doing that was so incredible, training for it and running it. Um, I had been working with young people in Boston in an educational and clinical capacity. And I wondered what it might be like for them um, to have such an experience. So a year and a half later, I invited some colleagues and friends and some of these young people to train with us uh, throughout the summer for the BAA half marathon. We did it and everyone's glowing at the end and it was amazing. Did it again the following summer, summer with new participants, same thing happened. Around that time, I, I chatted with um, some folks in the running community in Boston and said, hey, you know, this is the most famous running city in the world. Uh, why don't we second to New York, I'll say. <laughs> I see you jump on there, Jean. <laughs> um, you know, why don't we have anything like this? And they said, nobody's done it or no, you know, uh, it just hasn't been successful. In the so, long story short, ended up um, developing the program, going into the Boston Public Schools. Here we are 10 years later. Um, so the program is a community building and mentoring program that uses long distance running as a vehicle for setting and achieving seemingly impossible goals. So we invite young people, most of whom have never run long distances before, train with us throughout the year at their schools and community centers for a five mile race or half marathon at the end of the school year. Idea being, if you can do something as seemingly impossible as that, what else is possible? And you know, so much to what Eugene speak to throughout. I love that so much, Jess, you know, and I'll admit, I also hate running and maybe I shouldn't admit this here <laughs> because coach Jean and Jess are going to tell me to run, but maybe I'll try running this year. You know, your programs are, I mean, obviously different, but also similar, but I'm curious for both Jean and Jess, you both work so closely with your communities and curious, could you just say a little bit more about that work and my sense is why you believe it's so important to be doing this work within the community of supporting kids. Could you say a little bit more about that? Maybe we'll start with you, Jean. Well, um, in the community where, where I have the team in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, is where I grew up. And it's, it's an, well, it used to be an underprivileged community um, and mostly a minority community. It's beginning to change now, but uh, there were no opportunities for especially girls, but for children to be involved in something positive. So I thought that I could help by starting a track club and, you know, engaging the young women uh, and young girls to do something positive. Because really, besides a possible Girl Scout troop, there was nothing. So that's why I do it. Wonderful. And how about for you, Jess? I'm guessing maybe some of the inspiration the same. It, why is it so important to you to be working so closely with the community? Yeah. Um, so I'm not doing as much of the hands-on as, as Coach Jean, you are, and as I was at the beginning, uh, because we are currently in 14 schools and community centers. Um, but what's so wonderful about that is that I don't need to be. It's, it's not about me and especially, you know, owning my, my race as a right white woman working in a predominantly POC community. Um, it's wonderful to be out there training um, folks in the schools and community centers, whether they're teachers or principals or guidance counselors, um, to run these groups and, um, and to support these young people. They're with them day to day. So they then have the opportunity to have the, um, the things that they're learning in the program really ripple out into, into their lives and into their community. And then all that sort of goodness spreads. Yvelle, that makes me want to bring you in here and ask a little bit. So you're an old soul, right? Which means that you mentor and work directly with kids. Um, yes. So tell, tell us a little bit about why do, why do you do it and what do you love about it? And I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what you do, sort of like what's been the most surprising thing to you about being a mentor or a coach? Um, well, yeah. there's, there's, there's several key things. I mean, for me, being involved in the community in general is very important. Um, I think, you know, similar as uh, Coach Gene, as we had talked about in our, in our discovery orientation, you know, I'm a kid from Brooklyn, New York, just the same. And uh, my community was very important to me. Now, being here in this greater Boston community, when I look at what the, you know, what the kids have access to, what they're exposed to, it's so important that, you know, we all have stories. My generation, we can tell you stories, 
playing outside, mom calling you and saying it's time to come home and, uh, you know, and the street lights are just turning on. Um, we want these kids to have their own experiences. Now, for a lot of them, you know, when they're in school, if they don't, if they don't understand what we go through, because that's our experience, we have to help them get their own experience. So, not, so again, um, when I connected with, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with Jess, um, you know, we connected some years ago, but it was still a few years before we actually worked together. And uh, I found it was important because for the program that she had going on, really, it was really targeting that ele elementary school uh, group. When I look at what's going on in our school system, it's not that it's dire or it's not that it's great. It's just that they need us as mentors. You know, they need to see um, more people that may look like them or more programs that they can say, hey, you know what? I can get down with this. And to me, that was very important as far as having that community engagement. And that's, that, that's what made our connection so great here. And Eva, what qualities, I mean, I can imagine a whole host of, I mean, of, Qualities, but in your in your mind, in your thoughts, what qualities do you think as a mentor have helped you to be as effective as you've been? Because clearly, the mentorship connection is such an important, empowering yes. one. Great question. I think as a mentor, the the your mentees, the kids have to see that you're relatable. Okay, I mean, when you look at it, if I'm talking to them, I'm not going to talk to them as if I'm one of them. Okay, but they have to understand that you've been there. You know, so when I step in front of, now I'll give you a few examples. Uh, here, here it is, we're in the middle of the pandemic and uh, Jess calls and says, hey, Val, can you be part of this? You know, the kids need some kind of motivation and they need some kind of encouragement. That's right up my alley. I'm Mr. Energizer. Um, I'm Coach Energizer. So getting in front of them just had to be that I have to understand what they're going through. They're hiding behind the Zoom. They're hiding behind closed screens. How do you get them out of that area? And you have to make them feel comfortable enough to get out of there. Now, whether it's during the pandemic, in person, at the schools, they have to see that, you know what, this guy's pretty genuine. He knows what he's talking about. He's getting down there with us to do push-ups. He's getting down, up down there with us running. And that's very important. So when you connect with kids, they have to either, one, see that they can respect you. They can relate with some of what you're talking about. Even if you don't look like you're one of them, but you have to create that connection. So connection is so important to being able to be successful as a mentor. I think the, the message of connection resonates so powerfully with me, Yavelle, because I think that's something we're always talking about um, as mental health clinicians, supporting families and communities. And I saw everyone nodding, but JJ, I couldn't help but notice you were nodding through a lot of what <laughs> Yavelle was saying. I know the work that you do. And my guess is a lot of what he was saying really resonates with you. Could you talk a little bit about, I guess, his point around connection and mentoring and engagement and what you see in the work that you do? Sure. And, and we often focus on what engagement means to the mentee, but it means a lot to the mentor as well in terms of providing new purpose, giving an opportunity to, to give back to their community. And also research tells us that it can actually uh, have a positive impact on imposter syndrome that a lot of minority and women experience in, in various professions. So the idea that you have talents, you have gifts professionally, academically, emotionally, physically, that you can then transition or translate or give to other people, particularly youth, it's fulfilling, it's enriching, it gives you a purpose outside of um, other facets of your life. And that transition of skill and power and compassion and empathy can really do a lot of good for people. And that's why, um, although our schedules are busy and, and we could be um, given a lot of excuses to not lend our times to certain things, when we actually do, we, we have a great time uh, and we enjoy it. And not only do we enjoy it, but the mentees enjoy it as well. I love that. So there's like these benefits for the mentors and the counselors and trainers, et cetera. Um, what about like this is maybe maybe going in the, a little bit more the mental health direction, but JJ could speak a little bit about perhaps some of the mental health benefits that we sometimes see or that we expect to see in kids when they're engaged in community and sports. Could you say a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Uh, we think about self-actualization, the ability to see yourself accomplishing a task, getting better at that task, gaining self-efficacy, things of that nature, and really having an opportunity where Things are, it's not life or death, but things are on the line. There is a cost and there's a loss and you have to put in the effort. Um, I can imagine Coach Jean, because she's from Bed-Stuy saying, you know, there's a cost to be the boss. 
And the cost is hard work, it's dedication, it's showing up at practice, it's taking care of your grades. So having a youth have ownership over something and not only anything, but something that's beautiful, something that they're dedicated to, something that they can show off, that they can be proud of, um, having them have that opportunity to develop that and let it flower and grow is really meaningful because it's theirs. They made it, nobody gave it to them. They fostered it, they helped it grow and now they get to have the joy of watching that shine, not only for themselves and their family, but also for the people around them too. And that's something that you can't really take away. The world could strip everything away from them. We think about racial injustice. We think about homophobia. We think about sexism, but rains fast. Nobody can take that away from her. Uh, <laughs> athletes can do whatever they can do on the field or on the court or on the ice. They can't take that away from them. So some of the social injustices that may limit us in certain areas can't limit us when it comes to the field of competition and you line me next to another person and you you know fire that cannon or you shoot that pistol and I got to go 100 meters that's the true test that a lot of us enjoy as athletes. Well I think you see a lot of nodding here did where people did people want to add on? I mean, I think um, JJ is hitting a lot of key things and uh, it, it, it's, it's great to hear his perspective because, you know, we have to look at both sides of things. Um, whether you've done a lot of the study and we're being practically involved in it, we have to understand how all this, um, you know, correlates. Uh, he mentioned uh, self-actualization. Uh, I remember this is something that one of my coaches uh, taught us in college. Uh, we, we actually had a, a sports psychologist come out and, uh, and they were talking about the, you know, the importance of understanding how to become champions. And part of that is as athletes, you know, and one exercise that I continue to use now, our, our sports psych, psych at the time had us lay down on the ground and actually envision us, you know, on our events. Now, I, I, I also ran track and field. So we had to start off from the start of the event and actually walk through your entire event and see yourself crossing the finish line. Now, that, that aspect of self-actualization is very important because when our, you know, whether the kids are coming from the suburbs from, or from the inner city, they have to understand or they have to see what does that, that success look like for them, okay? And again, Coach Gene is out there showing them what that success is going to look like. The importance of uh, working towards earning that scholarship. Now, again, you're coming from an inner city. Getting that scholarship is a key not to just be the star athlete. It's a key to other exposures, other opportunities. And education is a key thing. So again, um, I give kudos to our coaches and, and, and um, you know, all those who are involved in the community to kind of help show these kids that there is another direction. You know, they, they should just be looking up to the, you know, to, to the local kid on, on, you know, on, on the side of the block, you know, or, or the bully or what have you. They have to look beyond uh, the extent of their arm, what they can see and see past that and say, you know what? I want to be involved with this, this, and this, or I want to go here for school. Or as Rain uh, mentioned, you know, she loves her track family and she couldn't think of anything else except for a track family. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as you're, um, you know, JJ, as you were saying the piece about, you know, how much coaches themselves actually, in terms of their own experience, um, get from these kinds of experiences. I, I find myself wondering because I know how much you're also putting in. I mean, I know it in sort of in ways that are even hard to quantify. How do you, with with all of the things you're needing to attend to, with all of the connection you're trying to foster, with with you know with the kids, with their parents and community, um, you know, how are you managing sort of rough spots for yourselves when things feel harder, when you feel more hopeless, and I don't know what sort of those sort of patches when it feels like your tanks are more on empty what what kinds of things do you do to help take care and manage your own sort of stores for sure it's uh that old airplane metaphor analogy simile i was never really good at english but comparison where it's you got to put take care of your own uh mask before you put on anybody else's and so um i don't want to speak for coach gene i feel like that'd be dangerous for me but i'm gonna make an assumption that she recognizes that for her to be the best coach that she can possibly be, she needs to take care of herself and to put all of her emotional eggs in the basket of coaching and not have other places where she's feeling invested, where she has rest and recovery, where she can be creative, where she can you know, let her hair down and have fun, to put all of it on that one area is going to lead to a lot of dramatic ups 
but also a lot of dramatic downs. And so being able to be well-rounded, being able to have support that extends outside of sport is really important because it takes, I have a three-year-old, so I can preach this all day. It takes a village to raise a child. So the idea that um, you know, Rain and other youth are supported by not only their parents, but by Coach Gene. And in the documentary, you could see when Rain's mom needed a little extra support, Coach Gene was there to kind of carry the torch. When Co Coach Gene needed some support, mom was there to carry the torch. So the youth had all these different people that they could go to for support, not only because adults get exhausted and fatigued by taking care of young people, but also because these different people had different specialties, different talents, different unique characteristics about them that made it fun. And so I think one of the things that Coach Jean does is that she's able to say, oh, I can't do that, or that would be difficult for me to do, but I know who can. I can give you this person, or I'm going to introduce you to that person, so that she's able to manage her own stress and do the things that she does really well, but not overextend herself too much by trying to do things that it might be better for somebody else to do and get them involved to helping out the youth. So I think that that's an important part of it, knowing where your limits are and not overextending yourself too often beyond your limits. It takes a village metaphor. I know people talk about a lot, but I think it really is so true. And I'm curious, Jean, because JJ was mentioning you and how you do it, but I'm curious, Jean, like for you, how, how do you do it? Um, do you think about that too, that it takes a village approach and how do you keep your gas tank full when you're helping all these young women in your community? <laughs> I mean, it is exhausting, um, but what I do is I surround myself with other coaches, uh, my coaching staff, who are girls who used to run for me. So they already know what I'm looking for and what I'm trying to do. We all, what makes Juness work so well and be so much like a family is because we all have the same mindset. These girls started running for me when they were seven or eight or nine years old. And then they grew up into adults and came back to help me with the team. And also they know what to expect. And I, and I tell the girls on the team, listen, I grew up in the projects. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. And I decided that this is what, this was my goal. This was what I was going to do. I didn't know anyone else who, you know, in my family who went to law school or became an attorney, but that's what I made up my mind to do. And that's what I did. And I want them to see that you can make up your mind to be whatever and take the steps to be that. And that's why they need goals. Um, but it, I mean, I do get exhausted or, you know, disappointed, tired, but my, my coaches, my younger coaches are always calling me to check on me to make sure I'm okay, you know, to see how my day is going. So that really helps. It's like, I have a thousand children. Mm. <laughs> it matters so much. Right, Ty, this is something in our work with parents and an educator that comes up a lot, the idea of fatigue and burnout and the importance of taking care of yourself, especially if you're someone who's taking care of others. Um, and I guess I just want to underscore to all the um, wonderful messages you all have already shared that some of these strategies are not just for coaches of athletes, right? This applies in whatever field that you're working in or the, the visualization exercise that's for young athletes, but it could be for kids pursuing whatever it is that they're pursuing, whatever their dreams may be. I'm curious, as you all have been talking in your different roles as coach, mentor, trainer, counselor, director, whatever it may be, um, not to be negative, but life is hard, as we've said, curious about what may be some of the harder aspects of what you do, like what kinds of challenges, what are the biggest challenges that you face in your roles and trying to support kids and working in the community? Is there something in particular that comes to mind that is, is especially hard or challenging for you in trying to support kids? It's a tough one. Does anything come to mind? Eval, were you about to say something? <laughs> well, I, I guess I could take a stab at it. Um, you know what? I mean, I think from listening to Coach Gene and, uh, and JJ, they both had um, some very keen points that they made. Um, but I think a lot of it really is how, how do we how do we show our kids, our athlete, our mentees what success looks like? OK, I mean, I, I think 
you know, the whole idea of success, we think success is just getting through the finish line. Okay. And this is what track and field, this is what any sport is about. Right. But before you get to that finish line, how do you get someone to understand what running a 1500 meter means? How do you get someone to understand what running a 55 meter dash means? Because all these races, even a marathon, you know, as, as, um, as Jess mentioned, you know, running her first, um, you know, marathon is how do you get from the start to the finish and incorporate your community or your resources in there. And then the key thing to me um, really is I have to get into my athletes, my mentees head to say, I believe in you when they don't necessarily believe that they can do this. So for me, from that aspect, uh, you know, of coaching, you know, a lot of it is mental. I have to tell them, you know, the physical talent is great. It would only get you but so far, but the mental tenacity that we try to uh, instill in them is what's going to get them through that finish line and beyond. So a lot of it really uh, right now is how much of ourselves do we put into it uh, and, and then going all through those roadblocks, you know, going against some of what people tell them that, you know, you may not be able to do this, you know, and a lot of this is not just getting to the finish line. A lot of it is getting to school, you know, as um, Rainey's challenge, getting to proper high school, seeing that she could earn a scholarship. Those are the things that she's, uh, Coach Jean really embedded in her that, you know, she's got to get to that ultimate goal. And I think that's a lot of what a lot of us, um, you know, have to, that's, that's a lot of the challenge I go through. Are there other challenges that come to mind or, or inspiration? Because even as you're talking, Eval, I find myself thinking um, the inspiration of that work, but, but the challenges of it, right? And how do you hold your hope as you're supporting so many young people? Um, I just want to say that with me and with my team, some of the challenges that I face, um, I guess, come naturally as girls who started on the team when they were six or seven, become teenagers, become young adults, 14, 15, 16. Those are very difficult years for young girls. And they're there are years where there are so many changes going on and they're pulled in so many different directions. And, and I always see it coming, even if, if their parents don't, I try to warn them, but they, they don't listen. Um, and, but I'm always in the girl's ear trying to direct them to the right path. And, and all, any of you who have been teenage girls know that there are so many things going on and there are so many boys to choose from um, that it's hard to keep the focus. And that's, that's, that's a difficult thing for, that I have to deal with each year as more and more girls get older. And if I can just hold on to them and keep them engaged, then that's, that's the challenge. Sometimes it doesn't work and I have to move past that. Sometimes, I, I lose them and it's hard and I have to keep myself going nonetheless and look to the next set of girls who are coming through. So that's one challenge. Appreciate that honesty, Coach Jean. And I was just reminded, I had it actually written down on my phone because I thought it was so funny. There's a quote in the film at one point you, you say, you're giving advice and I can't remember if, if it was to tie or to rain. And you said, would ask yourself, would I say that if Coach Jean was standing next to me? And so as you're saying, you try to be that voice in their head. My sense is you are. Um, and so I love that part. But I'm also hearing this message, which is a hard one, is it not, everyone, of um, acceptance to a certain extent, of acceptance of what we, and the limits of sometimes of, of what we're able to do, even as you all clearly have so much hope. Um, and energy and enthusiasm and resilience, but some, maybe also an acceptance of, of the limits of what we're able to do. Were you going to say something, Ty? I think I was, I, I said something just as you're about to ask a question. Yeah, something that Jean said made me, um, and I guess also because Juliana, you and I work so closely with parents and caregivers, um, and you know, clearly we see them as indispensable um, to the functioning of kids. I would just love to hear from each of you about sort of how you view your collaborations with parents, um, what, you know, how you foster that connection, why you see that as important for both the kids and the parents themselves. I'm just curious how, how you interface with parents themselves. 
Maybe we could start with JJ because I think you do a lot of work with parents and your work supporting kids. And if others have thoughts, you could add on. Sure. Yeah. Um, it was interesting before I had kids, I would always align with the youth and just be like, oh, these parents, why can't they just listen? Da, 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 da. They're tired, all this other stuff. And then I have had my son and was blessed to have my son. And, and now I'm like, oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. So just being able to have a lot of empathy and compassion, I think that's huge and recognize that your strengths might not be somebody else's strengths. Your weaknesses might not be somebody else's weaknesses and really kind of work with the, the, the mound of clay that is in front of you and really leverage um, opportunities to get people excited and enthusiastic about their youth and, and what their youth is doing, but also their impact that they can have on their youth. Because I think it's my experience is I've had less instances of parents not wanting to be involved and more instances of parents being afraid of being involved. Um, so they could have a great coach like Coach Gene for their youth and not feeling like, oh, I don't want to step on Coach Gene's toes or, or I know my daughter can get great support from Coach Gene, so I'm just going to play the background. And, and you really having those conversations with them, it's like it's Coach Gene and you. It's not Coach Gene or you. And so being able to, again, leverage that idea of community support, being able to close the room and have conversations with the parents about the youth where they can speak honestly and freely and get support, get empathy, get understanding and be uh, have us be non-judgmental is huge, but really building an enthusiasm and excitement and get them uh, re-engaged with the things that they love about their kid or the things that they love about their students in their classroom or about the, the clients that they serve in the medical profession. I think that that rejuvenation of that excitement can be really important. And we often always need it. Um, you know, COVID hit therapists particularly hard. I had to reevaluate why did I want to be a psychologist? What made me get up in the morning? And to really have that honest conversation, I'm in a different place now because I can um, connect with that enthusiasm for youth and, and the work that we do. Juliana, you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, this is a classic Zoom error, is it not? <laughs> it's, just, it's, just the, it's just the nature of the world in which we now live. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, no, I just was saying that um, I recognize that everyone has a different, each of you have different roles and you worked with your community and families in different ways, but didn't know if others might have thoughts or ideas around this idea of working with parents and what that might be like and um, kind of, um, how you see your role and their role in, in supporting kids. Do you have any thoughts come up for anyone here? Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, so for us, it's, it's, um, it's an inviting in um, for the parents, you know, that they, they sign their kids up for this program and we say, come out to our, you know, our first 5k and there's a couple other events that they can come to. Um, but especially the goal race at the end. Um, and it's always amazing to see these parents, see their young people do something, work so hard, you know, something that many of these parents think that they couldn't do, right? And it's just um, like a leveling of the playing field in that way. And, um, and the kids are glowing at the end and feeling so proud of themselves and feeling on top of the world um, for their parents to, you know, JJ, I appreciate that you said like, you know, it, it can be very easy to get frustrated with, with your kids, I, I know from direct experience, and to just be reminded of those positive qualities of these young people and what makes them so great and why we have to continuously believe in them and, um, and remind them that, that they're, worth, they're worth it and that they're amazing even when they don't think that they are. So I'd say that. If I could just add on top of what uh, Jess was just said, um, I think uh, for the parents also, we have to work with them in helping them to, to know that their kids have a positive outlet. Uh, again, parents, they're busy out there working, they're coming out, they're wondering, okay, where's my kids at? Um, I know I spoke with the, you know, with, with one of my um, um, athletes mom, you know, she happens to be a sophomore and, and her mom says, you know, I would rather get her on an Uber to practice and pick her up. And in my thinking, it's, it's, just, it's a case of 
parents are also very protective. You know, they don't want to know that their kids are out there waiting for, you know, for the bus or train at a certain time. Um, but at the same time, for us, we have to help the parents understand that this is the environment that their kids are growing up in. Okay, and, and they need that level of independence. Now, I know Coach Jean, she, she's laughing. I mean, I, and I can relate with why she's laughing. Um, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, it could be Boston, it could be anywhere. But as a freshman, I'm taking a bus from, you know, from home to downtown um, Brooklyn. And then when my parents moved to Queens, I'm taking an hour and a half commute to get to school. But parents have to understand that when, when the kids have an outlet like track and field, like Soul Train, you know, the pro, uh, after school programs with running, uh, their kids have an avenue. And uh, all we look for, for them to do is, it's a, you know, it's, it's a reciprocity as far as we're there for them, but we need for you to be there for them as well as be there for us. So it has to be a revolving door of support where it's not just us as coaches, mentees, you know, um, you know physicians, you know, psychology, psychiatrists, psychologists, but it has to be the parents saying, okay, you know what? I have faith in what you all are doing because my kid is happy in what they're doing. I just have to say, I was laughing because um, when I get new parents on the team, I try to let them know that, you know, there are things that your kid can do that you would never think they'd be able to accomplish. But on the other hand, I always tell the parents to let the coaches coach. If your daughter has a bad day at a track meet, she doesn't want to get in the car and hear about it all the way home. Your job is to be her cheerleader and say, oh, you'll do better next time because I've already told her the things she's done wrong. She doesn't want to hear it again from you. <laughs> and also I was laughing because every year I have to inform parents that their child is no longer a five-year-old. She can get on the bus. She can get on the train. We live in Brooklyn, New York. Mass transit is everywhere. So parents, especially of girls, have this tendency to always see them as little girls. And But on Juness, we are big on responsibility. You are responsible for knowing when the meets are, knowing what time practice starts and stop. And I'm talking about the girls, not the parents. Um, for having your uh, items together to bring to practice or to bring to the meets and just being responsible for yourself. Every single parent meeting, I tell the parents, responsibility doesn't come in a card on your 18th birthday. That's something that you build up all during these years. And part of that is when your kid becomes a teenager, she gets on the bus and comes to practice by her darn self. And you can pick her up later when it's dark, but stop holding your kids back because one day, you know, you're, you're holding her back as a 15 or a 16 year old. And two years later, you let her go on the college campus and she loses her mind. So you have to make kids responsible for themselves. And it's always me <laughs> having to get on the phone and tell the parent off because I'm just going to tell you this one little story about a girl who was 16 and her father used to, her, she lived with a stepfather and her mother, but her father used to pick her and her little sister up to come to practice. One day he was late. She got on the bus, brought her sister to practice on her own to be responsible. She didn't want to be late. So her mother's on the phone with her at the end of practice yelling at her. So she, I said, what's wrong? She said, I'm going to get in trouble because I took the bus. So I said, give me the phone. Let me talk to your mother. <laughs> Hello, is there a problem? Well, she knows she's not supposed to take the bus. I said, she's 16. In a year and a half, she'll be in college. When are you going to let her take the bus by herself? When she's 21? Oh, but she's so small because she was short. But so was the mother. I said, so are you. But we let you get on the bus by yourself. You have to let her go. You have to let her be responsible. She's doing the responsible thing. So that's why I was laughing. <laughs> Jean, you made me laugh so much. Ty, it reminds me so much of, of the messages that you and I talk about, does it not? 
when we talk about like resilience and a muscle and, and all of the risk taking. Yeah. Yeah. Will you say a little bit about that? No, I think Jean, as you were talking, we were just, I think Julie and I were having parallel thoughts and I think it is true. It is hard for parents. I mean, it goes against the like parental instinct, right. To ensure safety, but it is this real challenge of being able to step back enough to um, allow allow room for experimentation, room for mastery, and room for safe failing. Um, it's tough. I think it's tough to do. And I, I think it's wonderful when that can happen um, with a support network sort of underneath, right? I think that's ideal. Um, that's partly why programs like Soul Train and the Genesis Track Club, and for those who don't do sports, right, it could be in, in the form of something else. Is it music or theater or play or whatever it may be? But why those activities and the power of the family. Rain talked about her track family being a real family, like why that can be so powerful. And my sense is this is partially why, for many, many reasons, but partially why Sisters on Track is such a powerful film. Because you can see that, Jean, like you and the other coaches being that other family to the kids and pushing them, right? But it's hard, to, is it not hard to know like where that line is in terms of the tough love and saying you can get on the bus versus when do you step in and give a little bit more support? This might be really hard to answer, but I'm curious, how do you guys walk that line? Because I think that's a challenge a lot of educators and parents have all the time, right? Like when are you pushing too much? And when do you know when to ease back a little bit? How, how, how does someone know? Yes, JJ. It just it, hearing you talk reminded me of a good John Wooden quote where he talked about coaching is being able to provide correction without resentment. And so I think when you watch the film, you know, coach is really good at that. She can, you know, really simple, clear, direct, um, this is how you can approve, or this is what you did wrong and everything. So I think about the uh, situation in the film where um, there was the incident where she threw something at the teacher. Like coach Jean did a great job where she didn't make her feel like Coach Dean didn't love her anymore. Coach Dean didn't care about her anymore. She made her understand that she was disappointed, but that she was still loved. There was no resentment that was birthed in that moment. There was the opportunity for correction and the opportunity to always be seen in positive regard by coach, but to also understand that, yeah, what you did was pretty messed up. And we, we don't want you to do that because I believe in you and I know you can do better. And we often think about with kids with guilt or shame, the idea that, you know, guilt, shame comes from, and, and they may mean the same thing in Webster's Dictionary, but I kind of parse them out for the therapy work. Shame is, I did wrong and I know I could do better. And guilt is, I did wrong and I knew I couldn't do better. Or no, I flipped them, sorry. Guilt is, I did wrong. I know, right? I'm prepared to talk and I mess it up. <laughs> So guilt is I did wrong and I knew I could have done better and I feel guilty about that. And shame is I did wrong and I know I couldn't do better. And so the idea that you don't necessarily want somebody to feel shame, but you can have some element of healthy guilt that comes in that then fosters better behavior, that fosters the opportunity to pivot when put in a similar situation in the future. And so I think that we really want to think about when we're correcting youth or interacting with youth, are we building resentment, resentment that they're going to have towards us, or even resentment that we as mentors, as coaches, as educators or teachers are going to have towards them? And how can we have that interaction be healthy and be enriching as opposed to now we're just proliferating all this resentment in the relationship? Yvel, you talked about connection earlier. So I'm just reminded about your earlier comments about connection. And that just reminds me, it all comes back to connection. Right. I mean, it's like it's, you have to you have to maintain that relationship and preserve that connection. And I feel like that's the foundation to so many other things or whatever your relationship may be. That's something that Ty and I talk a lot about, the importance of connection and really being attuned, you know, to to each other in whatever relationship you may have. I'm mindful of time, Ty. Should we do our, our wrap up question, even though I know there's so much more we could talk about? Yeah. So in our last minutes, um, if we could ask each of you for our audience today and those who might be watching later, or for those who watch Sisters on Track, is there a, a final, I don't know, takeaway message or 
that you would want young students or adults or parents or educators to leave with? And you can choose whoever your audience may be, but is there something, some final message that you'd want to leave our audience with? We can start. Oh, go ahead, Yvelle. Well, again, you know, I think the, the, the documentary, the movie displayed so many different lessons. And I think the key thing, what, we want, what I, I want to get out of it and what I would share is that um, life is a journey. You know, we want our mentees, we want our athletes, we want everyone to understand that to me, life is a journey. And that's how I approach a lot of um, my coaching. Every aspect of the experience that you pick up along that journey is what's going to help cultivate you as you become from a young adult to an adult and what have you. And I tend to use uh, sports as a metaphor. I think, you know, if, if from a coaching perspective, you know, whether you play football, basketball, baseball, track, you know, it doesn't matter the sport, it's the lesson you, we, come, we, we, we get out of this. And I think out of the documentary, there are plenty of messages and lessons that were displayed from the perspective of coach. But the coach also has a number of other hats that she's worn. So I'm using you, of course, Coach Jean, but again, we're working with um, Jess with, with Soul Train. I see Jess, she has multiple hats and we all have different perspectives of how, you know, where we come into the picture. But ultimately, uh, I like my athletes, my mentees to know that the things that they're learning, the lessons that they're picking up from me right now are things that are gonna help solidify them as the individuals and the persons and the characters and the personas and all these things that they, that they don't know that they can yet become when they arrive there, they'll be like, wow, I didn't realize that the coach was giving me all these lessons all along the way. So that's the, that's the beauty of having the positive connections because you never know where it's going to go, but we do know how it should impact them. I love that. Are there other final messages that people would like to share? I just want to say that I'm so glad that People are getting so many good and positive messages from the film. Um, <laughs> one of my friends watched it and she said, wow, it was just, you know, you were just like your, your real self. I'm like, yes, I'm not an actress <laughs> just doing what I normally do. But I think that people always talk about me showing tough love, but I don't see it that way. I just see it as I have a certain standard that I set for myself and for the girls, and I expect them to reach that standard. I expect them to reach that goal. And if you have expectations for children in anything, in school and in, in sports, in whatever they're doing, they need those high expectations so that they can make attempts to reach it. And, and and even if you don't reach all the way where I want you to reach, if you try, then you're successful. And I see the success coming back to me when the girls who I've coached uh, either bring their children to have me coach, which makes me feel really old, or they come back to help me coach, or they just check in with me. You know, on Mother's Day, I, I swear I get like a thousand text messages, but it's just girls that I've coached that are either on the team now or were on the team 20 years ago that are checking with me. And that makes me feel good because I had an impact in their lives. And that is success to me. There's no question, Jean, that you've had an impact. And so many people have referenced it here and know it through the film and obviously know it from the lives that you've touched. We cannot thank you enough. Of course, we wish we had more time with all of you. I could sit and listen to the four of you for hours. Um, and sorry, unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you so much for the incredible work that you all do to support the emotional wellness of kids and teens, whether students or student athletes in your life. And appreciate so much this really important discussion. Thank you um, for coming to share with, you know, all that you are doing with our community. We just so appreciate it. So, and a special thanks to, of course, to Rain and Corinne for joining us in the first part. And I know we're just a minute over, but we have a few very last minute announcements to share. So for those who want to know more about the film, of course, nowadays you can just get on the internet, but you can Google, but we have Sisters on Track. You can go there to learn more. 
Also, if you want to learn more about the Jeunesse Track Club, um, this is a grassroots community-based track club for girls, as Jean talked about, and this gives them an opportunity to grow in the sport of track and field while excelling in academic achievement and life experiences, and you can visit their website there. Soul Train Boston, as you guys know, and Boston Runs Together, this is a program of Trinity Boston Connects, and this is an incredible local community building and mentoring program that uses running as a vehicle for achieving impossible goals. And you can visit their website to learn more. And to just learn uh, more about the Resilience Project and the services we offer through our school programs and parent and caregiver programs, you can email us. And for those on social media, feel free to follow us on Facebook. Um, tonight's webinar is part of a uh, year long series of building resilience. Um, and you can that will be on our website as well. On March 9th, we're gonna be having another um, webinar that's gonna focus on the pediatric mental health crisis. It's gonna be a round table. Um, so we'd love to have you attend. Um, we're looking forward to that. Um, on March 22nd, we'll have our first in a series of webinars about eating disorders in students. And in April, there'll be a webinar for students and parents on the topic of transitioning to college. We also have our um, popular Raising Resilient Teens and Kids parent workshops that are um, ongoing right now. We offer them three times a year. Our spring registration is now open. So if you're interested as a parent, please email us to register. In our last few seconds, these are just a couple quotes from the film. Though there are so many that we love, but these two in particular, we thought would be a fitting way to close out our webinar tonight. This is one from Ty, some of you may remember, in your time of need, just know you're not alone because there's always someone there to help you. Family, friends, people you don't know. I think she learned this from Eugene. They'll help you along the way. And you also have to remember that you have to work hard yourself because it's going to be your future and you should make it your own. So then I think you'll have a pretty good life. And our last quote is from Jean. The girls always had that talent deep inside of them but they needed someone to show them how to use that talent. And that's what I'm there for. And that's what you all are doing day in and day out in the incredible work that you do. And for those who are joining us now or joining us later <laughs> with the recording, um, know that we appreciate the incredible work that you're doing to support the youth in your lives. And thank you so much. And please take care of yourselves as you do your great work. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>